Good morning. It's Wednesday. It's 11 o'clock. That can mean only one thing. It's Trump week. I'm Tim Apicella, your host, and uh, welcome. And this week's title is Trump's Plan, Whistling Dixie, Defending the Confederate Flag and Statues. Uh, you know, years ago, many years ago, um, I was talking to a very uh, seasoned veteran, uh, an HR director human resource director. And she made the comment that Tim never tried to assign rational behavior to an irrational person. And I thought about that and it's always stuck with me, but I think for the last year and a half, I, I have forgotten that lesson because I've been trying to over and over and over again, trying to assign rational behavior to the president of the United States and um, banging my head against the wall. So, you know, there could be a lot of reasons for this. Um, we may think Donald Trump is smart enough that this is all a grand strategy, or we could look at it from a different perspective, and that's um, the perspective from uh, professional psychologists and psychiatrists. In 2017, a book was written with the help of 27 separate psychiatrists called, the book was called The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump. And uh, again, this was, uh, co-written by 27 separate psychiatrists, and they uh, labeled Donald Trump as a clear and present danger. In the next week or so, we're going to see a book from Mary Trump, who's a clinical psychologist who had direct observation, direct experience for years and years and years on her uncle, Donald J. Trump. And uh, she lists Donald Trump as a sociopath and scores nine out of nine when it comes to being a narcissist. So I go back to that comment, never try to assign rational behavior to an irrational person. Or in this case, maybe Donald Trump has some severe mental illness. And uh, that takes me to the topic of the day, and that is the campaign. The campaign which he is going to use, overtly use, racism to win the day with his base and hopefully win the election. But we'll discuss that in a minute. I'd like to introduce our guest today. Good morning, Winston Welch joining us, Stephanie Dalton and Cynthia Sinclair. Thank you everyone for coming. Welcome to Trump Week. Thank you, aloha. Uh, Winston, let's start with you. Um, you. You've heard the comments this week at Mount Rushmore. Uh, you've probably heard the comments at uh, the White House and basically saying that these, this heritage of ours, presumably a Confederate heritage, needs to be preserved and the protesters need to stop uh, destroying statues or having these statues taken down and that uh, he's gonna do whatever he can to defend those statues and preserve the heritage from the liberal Nazi left. He used the word Nazi. So um, clearly a, a path that he has charted for himself as it pertains to an election that is now a mere four months away. And the question is, will this strategy work? Um, a lot of Republican senators and, and congressmen seem to be very uneasy with it, although they're not speaking out overtly against it, except for um, Liz Cheney. Uh, most of them are, as usual, silent. So uh, any, uh, any uh, impressions about his Mount Rushmore speech? You know, it's, it's just hard to listen to him whenever he speaks. <laughs> uh, Cynthia said so he's, got a, he's got a word solid um, that was coming up. But essentially, this strategy of uh, there was a good article, it was the New York Times or Washington Post, that said Trump may be the last president of the Confederacy. And I think that's true that the, the, whatever pandering he's doing now towards, uh, yeah, you know, the white suburban voters or, wh or whoever it is that he's, he's going after, will be, it's, it's failed. Uh, this is a day late and a dollar short. Uh, it might have worked before uh, the um, George Floyd uh, killings and subsequent uh, uh, demonstrations in 450 cities and towns across the nation and then the world might have worked then, but it's not going to work now. Um, you know, you, you have even Mississippi that changed its flag, NASCAR. I, it, it's just like, okay, folks, yeah, we got it. These are bad symbols of hatred. We're not going to keep them up anymore. And if Let, he wants let's remind the audience of some of the, the Donald's greatest hits of racism. Um, the first one comes to mind is the Central Park Five. You know, he ran full page ads in the newspaper about the guilt 
uh, the guilt of the people that were uh, accused of the, the rape in Central Park. And then let's fast forward to the, the birtherism issue with, Donald, uh, with Barack Obama and how that uh, Barack Obama was not uh, born of this country, therefore he's ineligible to become president of the United States. And uh, basically I also wanted to see his, uh, his college degrees because how could, how could an African-American go to college and, and graduate, especially uh, Barack Obama? Uh, you know, then let's talk about the Mexican uh, judge, uh, quote unquote, Mexican judge that Donald Trump uh, thought was not authorized or, or credible to judge his cases. I think specifically this was the university fraud case and that uh, judge, I think his name is Judge Curiel, should recuse himself because he had Mexican descent and therefore wasn't qualified. Then we can go on, on and on of two recently, and that is uh, the retweeting of a, a video uh, at the Villages at, in Florida, where within eight seconds into the video, which of course Donald Trump said he never saw, um, these guys are on a, a golf cart, fist, fist enacted and saying white power. And he retweeted it and basically stood by it. Or we could talk about um, back in Charlottesville, few years ago where uh, he assigned the, the moniker very good people on both sides. So neo-Nazis and KKK, which was part of that group, burning their torches as walking down the street, um, making uh, statements about the anti, uh, anti-Semitic statements, um, very good people on both sides. And last but not least, you know, our comments about NASCAR and um, the fact that NASCAR is going to lose ratings because they're banning the Confederate flag and asking Bubba Wallace that, not asking, but suggesting Bubba Wallace should apologize uh, because the noose in his garage was already there and therefore his concerns was a hoax. Donald Trump likes to use that word hoax a lot, doesn't he? But anyway, these are just some of his uh, greatest hits and I, there's many more. I don't have time. To, we don't have time to list them all, but... Um, what makes you think, Winston, that this won't work this time again, like it did in 2016? Well, people have woken up a little bit. I mean, even when you're surveying uh, his base, they're saying this is actually, race is actually a real issue in America that we need to address. It's, it's at that time. So it doesn't matter, even in the places where they say, I was reading a, a, a broken down uh, survey that said, even where there's riots that have gone on or lawlessness or, or where they said this, these were violent demonstrations, they still said, this is the race issue we do need to tackle. We need to address it. It is, it is beyond uh, partisan politics. And so therefore, when you've got your own people that are supposedly your base that this is going to play to, and they're not buying it anymore, uh, he needs to start selling something different real fast. And either it's got to be, uh, I don't know what it's going to be, but you know, it was like uh, we said last last week when we were talking before the show, remember last week it was all about, do you think that the that this will be the last straw about the, um, the uh, pay price on the, the bounty price on soldiers um, in Afghanistan? That's so old news now because we've had, uh, you know, the statues saying uh, COVID's 99% okay, um, the book by the niece, um, super spreader events, uh, you know, now he's saying masks were okay. There's so many different things that have happened in a week that this just, uh, the, and then the NASCAR thing, the, the, the whole, all of it, it, it's it's just sort of, you can't keep up with it on an hourly, a daily basis, much you know, like you got to pretty much go by the hour. So, so almost, he's, you got to find a new issue. There's almost nothing that breaks the, 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 the straw that breaks the camel's back. It's almost impossible to find one, one activity or, or one statement that could possibly come from Donald Trump where everyone just says that's a bridge too far. It doesn't seem like there's ever a bridge too far anymore. This one is this one isn't a bridge too far, but I think it's one that's been that uh, that the majority of his supporters and people are just saying we don't need to go there anymore. Um, it's just like it, it, there's certain things that we understand as a mass consciousness we don't need to go there. So it's not really something that's an egregious thing that's going to break any of his supporters' backs because there's so many other issues they'll support him on. But I just don't see him getting any traction with this anymore. All righty. Thank you, Winston. Stephanie, uh, do you believe Donald Trump is using race in the div dividing America as his primary strategy for the re-election re of his presidency? Well, I certainly agree with all or, or is it just a uh, soup du jour flavor of the week and he'll be on to a different strategy in a couple of weeks or a week from now? Or do you think this is the primary, the primary um, 
platform he's using? That, that's such a good, that's a good question, I, uh, Tim, because you're suggesting or you're questioning the strategy issue. And I think that not only our own observations, but others um, uh, more expert in, in all of this thinking uh, and acting have said there, there's no strategy. I mean, not only is there no strategy, there are no principles guiding anything. And this has come from, yeah, as you know, Bolton. And now I think this new new, new niece, new book of the nieces get, she gets at that too. But um, so th there we are with a person um, who is not developing in the role. And I think the great charity that was given to him in the beginning, the huge generosity and acceptance of him um, through the difficulties of that election to, to, to have a, a, some on the job training and some uh, legging up there learning curve, learning curve. I think that the United States uh, population has been so, and government, so generous to give him all the chances in the world to, to do things in uh, presidential ways. Who can know how, of course, who can know how to do that before you're actually in it? Yeah. The huge well, but no, it's time for other people to, to say that's over and we need mm -hmm changes there are I think that's the point and maybe the book will support this there's no development because he's not he's not engaging the process he's not learning he's not listening importantly he's not listening and he's not uh using anything well and that's he's not listening to his political advisors um the re-election campaign folks he's not listening to him the reports are he's going by his gut on this one and they don't they don't think and I don't think anyone thinks that it's a winning strategy. In fact, if you look at the swing states and the poll numbers, we're a solid 10, 11, 12 points. Even in um, you know, uh, Michigan and, and those critical states that he, he won in last time, and the polling numbers seem to suggest that whatever strategies he's using, either on COVID-19 or um, his, his insistence to defend the flag, the Confederate flag, and use racism as a, a basis for division, um, that strategy is not working and the poll numbers are reflecting that. But as we know, uh, Stephanie, is that poll numbers change. And yes, and also I, I suggest we just stop even using strategy as a way to describe anything. And yes, and also I, a really good point was made last night by one of the commenters that I'm thinking about, which is we have not national polls. Evidently that, that program doesn't really look at national polls very much because we actually have 50, 50 elections. Yeah. So, However, been, there are 50 separate elections. This is vis-a-vis -vis the developments with the Electoral College. But the point is that we've been generous. And now how much of this do we have to endure? And the United States population has gone by the rule of law, by letting this man continue doing what we could through the rule of law. And we have been so patient. And, and uh, we, we need to think about getting back to this and whether there needs to be some amendment of them yeah. giving us a way to think through anyway there's lots of that list of to do's as you can see i'm looking forward <laughs> yeah. well the list is going to be multi-pages <laughs> all right thank you cynthia excuse me thank you stephanie cynthia um what are your what are your thoughts on this on donald trump's uh racist strategy to become the second term president I believe that's what he is totally banking on at this point, um, because all of the people that voted for him before that aren't racist, they were just voting for him because they thought, well, I don't like Hillary, so I'm going to pick him. Um, kind of thing. See if he can, you know, we'll see what he can do. Give him a chance, like Stephanie was saying. And he's been given every chance. And those people are not going to stick with him. So his core base are those racist Southern well, not all Southern. I mean, we've got plenty in Idaho and spread out throughout the country also. But, um, and it's that Dunning-Kruger effect, which is why they follow him, because they're allowed to have those feelings and then have somebody get to a high position. So they are making it okay. It's like, well, I'm, it's okay for me to be like this, because look, the president is like that. So I guess it's okay to be that way. You know, it, it used to be said that Donald Trump is blowing a dog whistle, that only certain people can hear the, the sound of that whistle. Um, now they're saying he's just on a bullhorn and everyone can hear 
very clearly the racial, not only the racial comment that stands for itself, but the intent of what's behind it. I remember as a kid, uh, I was about 10 years old, uh, watching um, George, um, George Wallace run for president. Mm -hmm. And it seems that his comments were probably a little more subtle than Donald Trump's. Right. Um, I, I, I can't believe that Donald Trump is this overt in what he says and how he says it. Yet um, it's 2020 and again, maybe we go back to Winston's point is there's, there's no bridge too far anymore. It's just, it's one, one calamity after another and, and people are desensitized to it. And so the, the most outrageous racist statements that Donald Trump makes um, kind of hits the 15 second news cycle and we're on to the next calamity. Right, and I think maybe the news isn't really following that stuff anymore either. <clears throat> they don't give it the time on, <clears throat> excuse me, on the shows that they're doing because they're moving on to other things like COVID, which is so important. And, you know, the statue issue is kind of complicated because we've got now people saying they want to tear down George Washington because he owned slaves. And I think there needs to be a, a a line, a definite line of demarcation here that Confederate statues, people that supported the Confederacy that went against America, yeah, they should be taken down. You don't have to erase history. So was Donald Trump referring to Confederate statues and his uh, Mount Rushmore speech and his White House speech that the no one's going to tear down our heritage? Or was he, was he referring to Hamilton and George Washington statues. I, I definitely got the distinct impression he was talking about General uh, Robert E. Lee, uh, Stonewall Jackson kind of type statues. Absolutely, all along with the Confederate flag, which are the dog whistles like you were talking about to the base of racist people. And these are people that don't wanna face, they've had this racism inside themselves and they don't want to face it. And so finally there's somebody in a high powerful place that makes it okay. So now they don't have to hate themselves anymore. So there is nothing, literally nothing that Trump can do that's going to separate him from those people. Okay, and we, and we think, well, the numbers seem to reflect that somewhere between 38 and 40%. And as I said last week, is this a situation where he can count on that 38 to 40% of being activated and getting out of their armchairs and going and voting probably by mail that would help them, even though Don Trump thinks that's a fraud, um, being activated to the point where a, a high percentage of that 40% votes and hoping and wishing that the 60% or 55 to 60% that opposes him, uh, they'll be complacent, lazy, lackadaisical, and won't get out of their chairs to vote and uh, the numbers will win the day. I, I think I mentioned that last week. I believe that cheating is what's gonna win the day. Um, I don't believe that, that Trump has any hope of winning the majority vote. Um, I really don't. I well, you don't. and Joe Biden say it's the same thing. Joe Biden said it this week. His biggest concern is uh, he's going to steal the election. Right. And that's exactly why he's so against mail-in ballots. We got to remember that when Ivanka Trump got those, those um, what you call it, those, I know I say this every week, you guys are pretty damn sick of it, right? Okay, you got to keep it short. <laughs> what? Do you know more? I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I'm so curious. <laughs> Look into Dominion voting machines, voting company, voting systems, I believe is what it's called. And I believe that's where that software from China is. I, I did follow up on that on Snopes, and she does have the she does have the the patents on those. Exactly. Uh, so no, Snopes did did confirm it. Um, we haven't heard a whole lot more from it, but you're right. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch gears here, Cynthia. I'm going to go to Winston. You know, it's not just um, it's not just the racial uh, strategy that Donald Trump is using to set the polls apart, but also obviously what started it, I think, was his his approach to COVID-19, the fact that he was ignoring COVID-19, and now he's he's walked away from it. It it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, the most recent one was that all these cases. 95% of them were harmless. 90, uh, 99%. 90, excuse me, 99%. I stand corrected. Um, you have another show that you do. Uh, both, All three of you do a one called uh, Coronaville. So 
do you guys think that he has completely walked away from trying to uh, stamp out COVID-19 in the United States? And he, he, he wants to do maybe what Sweden did is, and try to get herd immunity and let a million plus people die because that's what it's going to take for herd immunity. And Sweden never did find it. I mean, that's what's happening. That's it's our strategy now is just let the state steal as best as they can. You basically, I think the thinking is you had three months to prepare from the very beginning where we shut things down and then we opened it up and you guys are on your own and good luck. And, and as you feel like you need to shut things down or open things up, that's what's going to happen. But basically uh, I had read somewhere where perhaps 50% of the population will be infected by the end of the year. Um, and if you're looking at uh, the rates, I think they're, they're realizing this isn't a third of the population dying. So it, it's, it's not what was in Italy and New York, but it may be in a week from now. We don't know what's going to happen after the July 4th weekend, but we can imagine based on some numbers coming in from Florida and uh, Texas and California. But basically, yeah, it's a complete abdication of responsibility uh, and involvement in COVID-19. We're not, I don't think the COVID task force is, if it's meeting anymore, we're not hearing about it, but Anthony Fauci is coming out and saying things like, yeah, uh, this should not be a political thing. You need to wear your mask. Donald Trump did come out and say he wasn't against wearing masks or something. It was some weird interview uh, that, that I saw the other day. So he's, I mean, allowing that it might be a possibility to wear a mask, but uh, you know, there, another article said, is he doing everything he can to not be reelected? And it would almost seem to be that strategy for, for the last year, but he still has a solid 40, maybe 50%. And that's what concerns me, as you say, about people not getting up and voting um, or putting the stamp on their, uh, you know, the ballot. He still has overwhelming support in this country. A plurality of people support him. And we have to realize that and they will vote. They are much more mo motivated to vote for him than people are motivated to vote for Joe Biden or someone else. And we, the election's quite a ways away. We don't know what might happen with health or with uh, VP choices or, or who knows what. So there's a lot more um, uh, roller in this roller coaster left. And okay, well, I, let me ask you this. The polls right now nationally is about 10 to 12 base, 12, 10 or 12 points off from, from Donald Trump to uh, Joe Biden. Uh, does that widen? It's, it's five states that matter, maybe six. And it's not even the states, it's the counties inside of those states. And they know that they really only need to target. If you watch that, that expose on um, oh, uh, Cambridge Analytica, uh, it, the way that, 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 that they target folks inside very specific gerrymandered districts is all that really matters. And that's who they're playing to. So I think Stephanie's probably right though. There's no, there's no strategy at this point. I think he's going with his gut, but he, has a very strong gut instinct. Those people vote. And as his niece said, if he were to, re, uh, to, to win the election by whatever means, the, our nation as we understand it is, is probably done or it would be so severely wounded coming out of another four years, we can't imagine what it would look like. So I wouldn't be complacent at this point. I wouldn't assume that, that Joe Biden is a shoe in I wouldn't assume anything. Um, All right. Uh, Stephanie, um, does COVID, Donald Trump's position on COVID-19, um, does that get any worse for the voting population? Same question as I asked Winston. Does it get any worse or does it stay the same? Oh, it's chilly and it's worse because as we've seen, uh, the lack of leadership is real. I mean, we know the lack of leadership is real, but the effect of no leadership, even in a country as smart and educated as we all are, and as intentive, you know, as as committed to our system as we are, we can't pull it together. Okay, we let me ask you this, because Winston said that, and I agree, but maybe with an exception, is that Donald Trump's base is Donald Trump's base. They're, they're with them through thick and thin. Now, a lot of his base is, you know, at a certain age and category where COVID-19 can directly affect them, possibly kill them. Does he lose or peel off any of those loyal supporters realizing that Donald Trump doesn't have their interest in mind at all? I, I don't think so because it's true in my view, 
as I've developed it or seen and experienced it, that they're only into being mouthpieces. They have, they are recognized. They are powerful. They are powerful with this man, and they don't have a voice without him. So I think that 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 phenomena of having emerged as a moving uh, force that can make have an effect is very much the power that that they'll they'll never relinquish that if they can. And that's pretty much. Uh, true of most humans. I mean, the, we're now down, actually, if there's a principle, it is the principle of human behavior. But the other, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, there's so much in that group about their thinking. And we talk about Trump's like a knee, knee jerk thinking and, you know, spontaneity and, you know, just going after whatever's in his best interest. But it's so inconsistent and all over the map, which supports how it's not principled and not strategic. Because like, for instance, with the Second Amendment, everybody has agreed that we're not talking about muskets. Okay, so if you take the, if, you know, this is anachronistic bump that I get stuck on, because we all agree that we're not talking musket, but if you're going to talk originalism, thank you, the former judge, if we're talking about arms, it's muskets. No, now we're into tanks. Get your own tank in your own group. <laughs> so Joe That's Biden would be well served to assure everyone that uh, the Democratic Party is not there to take away their weapons. Well, yes, there's that. But the point is with everything, even the statues, for instance, why are they taking down George Washington? Is there no consideration for at the time? At the time, there were mm -hmm. muskets. At the time, there wasn't a tractor. Okay, so at the time people came here and they weren't educated and they didn't have access to the culture. Of course, nobody bothered to help them with that. But the point is, what was the situation at the time? So you're born into an economy. If you're born in Egypt in 233-3 BC, you're <laughs> all right. Uh, right. So uh, I mean. Yeah, and so it's just like, so it's that I get stuck on that. So you can see I'm still struggling with it. But we all are. We all are. are. <laughs> all right. Um, thank you, Stephanie. I'm going to, uh, before we, we uh, end the show here, I want to get Cynthia on the record for this, this topic about his walking away from uh, COVID-19 strategy and onward to the election and let the herd immunity games begin. Absolutely. Well, they actually did have a task force briefing today um, that came out, no sign of Fauci, though, in the whole thing. Um, and then- Where's Dr. Brooks? Brooks was there. Dr. Brooks was there. Dr. You mean Burks, the, the woman Burks, yep. there. Uh, the Redfield was there. Pence was there. Uh, Azar was there. And the guy that- um, Jerry. Uh, Betsy DeVos, of course. Betsy DeVos was, of course, there. And now they want to take money away from the public schools and give it to the private school. So instead of going to the kids that are the most needy and the ones that need it the very most, in order to make it work so they can have a safe reopening. But, you know, Trump has said, even if the governors say they won't do it, he's going to override them and make the schools open. But this is what Trump thinks about, about all of this. Now, this is the word salad that, um, that Winston referred to earlier in the show. This is a quote from him on the second. Some were doing very well and we thought they may be gone and they flare up and we're putting out the fires, but other places were long before us and they're now it's got a life and they're putting out that life because that's a bad life that we're talking about. Okay, guess, Cynthia, guess what? With that word salad, you get the last word for Trump week this week because we've run out of time. Uh, Winston, thank you very much. Stephanie, thank you. Cynthia, with the word salad, much appreciated. I will see you next week. I'm Tim Apatel, your host, aloha.